My name is Victoria Johnson. I am a quality compliance specialist here at Providence Elder Place. I am 26 years old and I live in Seattle, Washington. And today I will be having a wonderful in-depth conversation with my coworker, my friend, my work mom, ongoing caterer, <laughs> um, Jeremy Edmonds. Well, thank, you, thank you, Victoria. And um, as Victoria intimated, Victoria is also my work friend, my colleague, and she is my work daughter. I'm Jeremy Edmonds. I'm a 58 year old black lesbian who lives on Vashon Island and I work for Providence Elder Place as a marketing and intake representative. Wonderful. So, oh, this conversation, are we ready? Yeah, I am. Let's get it. Let's go, as they Let's say. Let's get it. Let's go. So, <laughs> um, we are, we're recording in a a very sensitive time um, given COVID and then now we're seeing a, not even national, but a global uprising um, as a result to some of the things that we're seeing related to police brutality and the deaths of unarmed um, citizens. Um, but I do, before we start, want to really thank Providence and Providence Elder Place and the Institute of Human Caring. Um, these are such such rewarding opportunities to sit down and fellowship above anything else with fellow caregivers and learn a little bit about their experiences. So um, I really do wanna give a nice shout out and also a very special thank you um, for the opportunity for this. Agreed. Um, the first thing I thought of was how gratified I was to work for an organization that was interested in what I had to say and right. sought me out to say those things. And at the same time, I'd, I'd like to also say how heartened I am to work for an organization that believes in the power of um, nonviolent protest and supports all of us in doing right. this. And um, it's a beautiful thing. And I know a lot of people don't have that luxury and I'm very grateful. So I'd also like to echo what you just said that I'm very happy to be able to do this. Definitely, definitely. So I, I wanna ask you a, kind of kind of right out the gate um Go question about your experiences so okay. um, i'm 26 and you're 58 so right. we we have some decades between us right. um but somehow i i feel like our experiences are very very similar so i would like to ask you um point blank when was the first time that you can recall that the color of your skin was open against you wow um, my earliest recollection, there's two, and my earliest recollection, I was seven, and I wow, was seven. seven. I was in middle school. You were at, a child. I, I was in Talon, Connecticut, at Talon Middle School. Okay. And a young, I'll never forget it. This is young kid, little kid, same grade as me. I'll never forget his name. His name was Howard Lehew, and Howard used the N word and called me the N word, and I had never heard the N word in my life. I didn't wow. even know what it was. So I went home that night, having had my altercation with Howard, and I told my dad, who at the time um, was uh, chairman of the board of the first minority owned and operated bank in the entire country. It's called Connecticut right. Savings and Loan. It's also the first black insurance executive of Travelers Insurance. Um, wow. He was also the first selectman, which is basically mayor and head of the town council for any town in New England. So I come from a long line of people. I mean, I have a picture of my dad given the black power sign and black handshake with Jesse Jackson. This is something my family has always believed in. Here I am back with Howard Lehew. And I said to my dad, I said, daddy, call me a word that rhymes with wig. And <laughs> I said, my dad said right, yeah. it's okay. Cause that's the innocence of being a child. That's how that gets translated or how you ingest that type of Hatred. The first, the first, like many of us, is you're completely confused. You have no right. idea that your experience is so much vastly different than anybody else's. Right. And so, um, back to Howard, my dad gave me some um, appropriate tactics to use with the bully, which is basically what I did, and that resulted in me shoving him through a snow fence. I, I didn't do it to be mean. I did it because he hurt me and I wanted to show him that he did. Um, and then the next time was exactly seven years later. I was a wow. freshman in high school 
beginning my athletic career um, as a track athlete, which I was really successful at. But anyway, I got told by a classmate, an upperclassman, junior or senior girl, her name was Gina, and mm -hmm. she said that jungle bunnies and, and porch monkeys don't run long distances, and there aren't really reason for me to be out here running cross country because I was black and we all know black people don't run, wow. don't run distances. And wow. I remember the, how I felt, which was a whole lot of rage and pain and vulnerability and shaking. And I remembered thinking that I had just seen the thriller in Manila, which is a, for anybody over 45 is the famous fight between Muhammad Ali and George Foreman. Just call me out. I hear you because you're young. <laughs> <laughs> so I basically ended up clocking her and and I freaked out because I she was un, she was momentarily unconscious and I also helped me to realize at that moment that responding in violence wasn't going to be the way to solve anything just because you hurt my name and called me names wasn't a reason for me to react that way it did give me a lot of school a lot of schoolyard respect I didn't have to go through those things again but do you remember a time, Victoria, when you were confused by racism and when racism showed for you? How old were you? Um, you know, I had a very similar upbringing um, as you. My father was very um, pro-Black, was very Black power. Um, and he, I remember he would wash my face in the morning um, and just look at me and say, you look like a brand new penny because mm. my skin. And it was just, it was a really um, comforting moment. But I think a lot of it had to do with my hair. I didn't necessarily understand why my hair wasn't straight. And I didn't understand why all the other girls got to wear their hair down, but I had to wear my hair in a braid or in a ponytail. Um, and it wasn't until a little bit later that I realized that um, society still views our hair in its natural state as unprofessional. Um, and so that, that really, <laughs> that kind of took the cake for me. Mm -hmm. um, I do remember having just girls be really mean to me. And I grew up in a upper, an upper middle class, I would say higher class area. Um, I was one of the only black girls in my school. There was one other um, black individual. Um, he was a young boy and I believe he was Nigerian. Um, but people actually were really nice to him because he was good at sports and I did not want to run. I wanted to eat cookies and be a normal girl. And I never really was able to do that. Um, and then I also kind of learned as I got into high school that I, I didn't sound, I guess, like all the other black girls, or I didn't, you know, talk or dress the way that they did. Um, and in turn, that actually resulted in not being black enough for black people, but not white enough for white people. And hence the term, hence the term Oreo. You know, I, I had a, a guy actually break up with me and call me a pretentious Oreo well, as an insult. So um, been there, done that. Yeah. Uh, but I feel like the moment that was really life changing actually didn't happen until I was a little bit older. And it wasn't until I started seeing more evidence that I am not safe in my own skin doing everyday things. Um, right around the time of the Oscar Grant, did you ever watch Fruitvale Station? Yes. Okay, so right around the time of the Oscar Grant, um, the Oscar Grant shooting and then, or the Oscar Grant death, and then you go into, you know, the Trayvon Martins and then the Sandra Blands. And so it's, it's been going on for so long that I began to have moments where I realized that, oh my goodness, you know, there, this isn't just some person who just died. Like these are almost systematic or almost, you know, not even planned, but in very intentional in a way. And I think what it resulted for me was it turned into a, a form of confusion and what often happens with confusion is sometimes there's a little bit of rage. Mm -hmm. And so um, I would definitely say that as I've gotten older, I am definitely more sensitive to it because I wasn't raised in an area where, you know, things were, you know, I was taught about the color of my skin or our, even our history. I didn't, I didn't even learn about that until I got older. And I'm actually like 
related to Black history. Um, I believe I've told you. So um, I do have a family member who is, you know, a very well-known inventor. And so to to know that, okay, you know, I I come from this family, I come from this history, but it's constantly minimized or at any point in time, I could be unsafe for going to the grocery store or even for walking my dog is immensely scary. Um, and it's something that I feel like I'm trying to work through. But what's interesting is you're 58 mm-hmm. and you've had very similar experiences to you know what I've had being mm-hmm. 26. Um, is there anything that you, would you say that it's gotten better? It's gotten worse? It's just kind of is you know, what it is. What is your overall feeling of just, and, and I want to ask it from the standpoint of civil unrest. Mm-hmm. So we are, especially as black women, we are doers. We do a lot of things, especially out of love. You taught me that. Um, we do a lot of things out of love. So how does it feel being a, a black woman operating out of love and knowing that you have so much to give and you just want to take care of people and seeing this happening? Mm. Well, first of all, it's a, it's a great question. And I just would like to say what I'm struck at, it, both figuratively and literally, is that here we are, two women on the same screen, um, one gay, one straight. We're both different generations, and we've both had the same experience, which mm. on the superficial level answers your question that really things haven't changed. That right. would be a superficial answer, but that's not really the honest answer. The honest answer is yes and no. Yes, things have changed. But when I am faced with you still feeling the way you do 30 years after I was on this planet, when I look at the injustices that we are still suffering, and let's be clear, it took the collective society at large, the world to be upset about the murder of this black man as the video showed someone on his neck for eight minutes and 43 seconds. The sad part is, is that it took a video of such depravity to get people to believe what black people have been saying for so many hundreds of years. It's like, well, sarcastically, black folks will tell you the best thing that ever happened to black people was the invention of the iPhone or the camera phone, because that meant that what we were experiencing couldn't be denied any further. Right. We were were alone naive in that because sometimes things were denied even with irrefutable evidence. But this leads me to something that a really simple analogy I heard regarding racism that really kind of characterized and crystallized for me what we're experiencing. And that is, is that racism is a lot like dust. Mm -hmm. Like like dust, racism is invisible. Like dust, um, racism is permeable everywhere. Like dust, you don't see it until you're absolutely physically, emotionally, and spiritually choking on it. That is when we all know that racism exists. Like dust, when you shine a light in a dusty room, the the sunbeam of light is what shows you where the dust is. We We need that sunlight of society and that sunlight of equality to shine on this dusty room we have of racism. I just celebrated this past weekend, my 14th year of sobriety. Congratulations. Thank you very much. And a lot of what I've learned and the lessons I've learned have come through the uh, prism of uh, my recovery and sobriety. And one of the things that I've learned is that there is no statue of limitations that I can put on people as to when they have to ascribe and stop buying my BS. In other words, I was an alcoholic for many years and I caused a lot of collateral damage for those who tried to hang in there and be with me. And it wasn't (laughs) until I got sober that those relationships changed. Point being is that with regard to the situation of racism in this country, my ask of people, of, of white people, is that they sit with being uncomfortable that they sit in that, marinate in that, and understand what that means to feel that uncomfortable. Because it is only through pain, I have learned in my recovery, that we grow. If we were all happy all the time. We would never grow. 
we would never grow because you wouldn't know the difference between being unhappy and happy. You would have nothing to compare it to. The same goes with right. this uncomfortable feeling that I need people to sit in. I need you to sit in it and understand. And the last thing I'd like to say, the most important thing is, or a very important component is, as you sit in this uncomfortable feeling and as you try to not stay there and to reach out and to say to, to Black people, hey, I really understand what you've been through, or I'm really trying to understand what you've been through. Please, please don't recoil if that hand is slapped. If, if the person on the other end does not receive your grace, right. it, just means, it just means that grace isn't able to be received, not yet. And my ask of white people would be that they keep extending their hand. This is the only way it's going to change, right. is if we all begin to forgive ourselves, and each other. And that's where it has to start. So I ask, and my prayer going forward will be for mm -hmm. patience and that people understand um, that if the hand is slapped, please extend it again. Don't, please keep extending that olive branch because that's really, the way it's going to change. I think that's beautifully put, honestly, because I, one thing I've noticed and I try to um, use when I talk to people is we are, even though, you know, we rely on a lot of our experiences with each other, we are individuals. We're born alone. We will essentially die alone. Um, but what makes life so meaningful is the lessons that you learn and the experiences and the fellowshipping that you get to do. So you and I have been fellowshipping for, for a while, well over a year, I think, because we just oh. celebrated year year and a half actually year and a half year and a half so yeah it is year and a half um so like thinking back on it you know fellowship is such a huge part of the human experience while i can't touch your arm and take away your pain i can actually listen to what you're saying and think about a time that maybe i felt that way and empathize and i think that this especially what we're seeing in the news and people um, protesting is it's really just reaching out for human fellowship, just asking and giving the opportunity for people to step into our shoes because it, it's not, it's not an easy shoe to fit into. Um, and like you said, it, it is very uncomfortable, but your greatest moments of growth come from your discomfort. You, and I was talking with my mom about this, um, we, I was t asking her, you know, what happens if I make a mistake if I do this thing? And her, her advice to me was, it's not a mistake, it's a lesson. You learned something. You didn't have, you, you then realize something that you didn't know previously. And mm -hmm. I feel like that's a little bit what this is, is it's just a learning lesson. Mm -hmm. But the problem is, and you hit it beautifully on the head, is that we have, we are casual dusters. We dust whenever there is company coming over or if we have to take a picture and we don't want our the background to look dusty or if I'm taking a mirror in the selfie, I got to wipe down the mirror really fast so no one thinks I'm dirty. Like there are times where we address racism, but we do it not with the intention of learning or understanding. We're doing it just so that it doesn't leave a nasty impression on what we want other to, others to perceive us as. And I think that's my frustration with it is I'm a very big doer. I am very big. If you walk the walk, you should talk the talk. You know, if you're going to do something, you should. My grandmother was very big on your word is your bond. You stand by it. And so what's interesting and what we've seen is and I do actually want to touch on um, what the phone or what technology has essentially done for um, bringing to light these police brutality cases and showing what it's like to just want something so simple as basic life and to be able to do, go to the grocery store and pick up formula or pick up, you know, trash bags or whatever the case may be is almost a fear that we can't even leave our house to do anything. And there, it came from somewhere. And I think I'm frustrated because I want to know where it came from. I want to know why, you know, we've, we've decided that, that one life means more than another life or it's okay for people in this uniform. And one thing that I struggled with was there are a lot of people who do see Black Lives Matter um, 
as an organization. They see it as a terrorist organization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had a very in-depth conversation about, no, it's not a terrorist um, organization. We're, Mm -hmm. We're really just marching for a chance to have a normal everyday life. That's really all we're asking, where we don't get pulled over, where we don't get tased for not getting out of a car. Um, there were two college students in Atlanta who, you know, the, the young man actually was on the news and said he had the piece of the taser left in his back for eight hours. Can you imagine that? Eight hours. And you, and I think for me, my frustration um, and being 26, so I'm happy that in a way, like we have these videos, but at the same time, I'm so mad. I'm so mad. And it's hard not to be in a state of rage or to be in a state where you're almost jaded. Um, and my, and I, I think we've gone kind of down this road a little bit, but one thing that annoys me is that when we try to get passionate about it, we're written off as angry black women. Yeah. We're angry for having any passion, whether it's for, and you and I both work in healthcare, we both work with a vulnerable population of elderly, um, so being vulnerable and or actually being advocates for these vulnerable populations or for these vulnerable people or even for the work that we do, sometimes it can come off as being an angry black woman. And I feel like that's so that's so unfair because we just we care. We and like I said, we're women. We operate out of love. And as black women, we we especially operate from a place of deep love and witnessing sorrow consistently and not wanting to see that again. So that's another thing that I, I would love your experience on a oh, little bit. So many questions, so many thoughts. I know, I'm sorry. So, a little time. <laughs> a couple things that I wanted to talk on about what you just addressed. It, it sounds sure. to me, if I could put it in two words, it would be describing the experience of everyday racism and finding us, you know, Know, what black folks go through every single day before we even get up to get into an office. There's a thousand things that we've got to consider. Right. And to your point of, ang- of of angry black women, one of the things that when I first came to Elder Place, I remember a manager speaking to me and saying, um, it's great that you're here and you're going to be the um, and helping us gra- d- diversify who we enroll in Elder Place. And that's a, a great thing. And initially, when I joined Elder Place, some was it was shared with me that they thought that it would be hard for me to interact with different ethnicities because, wow. right, maybe Asian folks wouldn't want to talk to me, maybe wow. or, you know a whole myriad of people, but that I need to be prepared for that inevitability. Well, happily, I can say that's never happened. I have never had one elder ever say anything to me. Uh, about my race or who I was. Mainly what it comes up is about my name more than anything else. Okay, fine. But really what I I wasn't prepared for was how many ways that I would have to stand in my truth and how many ways I would have to politely uh, discuss the things that are hard with folks that didn't see that what I was saying was a problem. I can't tell you how many emails I've had to write over again for the fact that if I said what I really wanted to say, which was always to advocate for the person I'm working with, it's never personal to the recipient of my email, but I've had to change how my tone is written in an email for just that that stereotype that I don't wanna be personified as an angry black woman, because if that happens, nothing is going to get done. I, I think if I could, that really, in the, given this, this amazing opportunity to have, we've, we've been afforded, Um, As I think back to George Floyd, the hardest thing about that video for me was that he was a a man who in his last breath called for his mother. And I am a mother. I'm a Mm -hmm. mother of a 20-year-old African-American male who's amazing and bright and kind and giving and lives for his community. Mm -hmm. And to be honest with you, I told this to him that... Well, I always, when I had my son, I wanted to raise a good human being. I wanted to raise a person that would be part of society and not take away from the things in society, not be a drain on society, but just be a good person in society. Right. I have told him this, that he has far exceeded 
anything I had ever dreamed for him in becoming the man that he is. You've met Noah. He's an amazing person. Mm -hmm. So I say all this to say that as a mom, watching George Floyd cry for his mother when he was being murdered told me that I never, ever, ever get to say, okay, my son is raised, my son is good, and I can send him out in the world and let him be the adult and the man that he is intended to be, that he wants to be. Watching that man die in front of me, crying for his mother, taught me that I have to worry about my child until I draw my last breath. It's a lot different of a worry than maybe some of um, the white moms and dads that I know have to deal with. You know, all kids struggle, all kids go through their stuff, but at some point in their life, you as a parent get to say, you know what, Johnny's good. He's got a wife, great job, he has a home. He's doing great. I don't have to worry about him. I can just work, worry about me or something else. I will, right. never, I will never have that luxury. I will right. worry about my child until I draw my last breath, no matter what my child's doing. Because in the back of my mind, since the time the child is eight, I've had to tell him how to react when he gets a, when he attracts the attention of a police officer. Now, right. let's a little quick anecdote. Um, he goes to Wazoo. We live on Vashon, 250 mile car trip, five hours. Oh, and he bought a bright red car because he's a cougar. Great. Okay. <laughs> He's been pulled over several times. Right. Oh, wow. And he said it's the scariest thing that's ever happened to him. And yeah. what he does is, is he says, Mom, I, I know how to speak in a way and talk in a way that lets police officers know that I'm not threatening. And my heart breaks for my child. My right. heart breaks that he has to do that, that he has to subjugate himself in a way so that the bottom line is he leaves with a ticket and a fine and not dead. That and that's the crazy thing, talking. as much as you don't want a ticket, you don't want to lose your life. So if it yeah, comes I'm down to you paying- a ticket every time. Exactly, when it comes down to paying a $250 ticket, but what no one also talks about is, eventually, if you keep getting them, what that can do to your driving record, sure. or I think, yeah, that we don't talk about that, but then that also goes into the school or the prison industrial complex where there's so many more opportunities for black males or young adults to be slapped on the wrist that eventually it's just going to be well this is the final consequence we warned you but it was never it's never talked about that you i was purposely scoped out or i was racially profiled or extra eyes were on me during this time it's almost like a failure like you, it's almost like someone put, tied you to like a bag of sand and told you to run and then got mad at you because you weren't running as fast or you were running too slow. Um, and that reminds me of a story when, um, when I had first started dating my, my fiance. So my fiance, um, yeah, as you know, he's white. Um, and we met in Spokane, Washington. Spokane, Washington has, I think last time I checked, it was two, is 2.3% 2 black or something like that. But the joke that I had was all 20 of us are going to get together for Thanksgiving. It'll be okay. <laughs> um, there was not, um, I don't even know if there were 20 people. It was, it was a place where I would actually see another person of color, whether they were, um, African-American, black, um, from, down, ran them down. Doesn't, didn't matter. It? doesn't matter. You would do a double take. You did a double take. Anytime you saw a person of color, you'd be walking. You're like, oh, oh. And then, you know, you wave and talk to people. Um, but there was a night when I had dinner at my fiance's house um, and he lived closer to the border of Idaho. So that's also a factor in that. Mm -hmm. um, but we, I went out to my car and I was getting ready to leave. It was getting pretty late. And I saw that my tire had a flat and I was like, okay, well, I've got my donut in the car. My fiance is, or boyfriend at the time, he's here so he can help me. Um, but he actually had a tool in his car, which is kind of a portable air tire thing. So it like refills your tire. Um, so he went to go grab it. And I was like, okay, thank you. Um, oh, I forgot something upstairs in your house. Can I go grab it? And so while he was grabbing that, I ran upstairs. I was coming down the stairs 
walking and I see a, a security guard come like running towards me, like booking it towards me. And as he got closer, he saw that I was black. I was kind of near a light and he reaches for his gun or oh, yeah. whatever the case was. He started reaching for it and he gets closer and he starts yelling at me. What are you doing? Who are you? Stop. Like basically yelling orders at me. And if it wasn't for the fact that my partner had saw it, I don't know what would have happened because right. when my partner saw that the officer or the security guard was coming near me and with his hand where a gun would be, he quickly jumped in and said, no, 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 she's, she's okay. She's with me. Her tire just has a flat. I'm helping her. I know her. It's fine. But, but in that moment, I mean, I still think about, you know, my life, my life could have changed that night if it hadn't have been for somebody stepping in or having a partner there to kind of step in and say, oh, no, no, no. I see that this is going, going pretty, pretty badly, or this has potential to go badly. And it was, it was a harrowing moment. It was. Let's talk. And, and to that end, there's a couple of things I, I want to say, but very quickly, let's talk about the, 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 the level of um, vulnerability, the yes. level of, I can do absolutely nothing about my circumstance right now. And right. let's also talk about that you weren't even validated until another white person came to tell you that you were okay. And I All feel of, like that's so big. Sorry, not to cut you off. No, oh, no, no. It is big. It's huge because what it is is completely dehumanizing. And this right. goes back to the thousand little knife cuts that African-American people must subject themselves to to be productive members of this right. society every day. You have to understand a couple of things. And this is where history plays a big role. And probably where I need to bring up, I was a history major in college. Drop oh. the mic. No, just, <laughs> I was a history major in college. But one of the things that is really evident in U.S. history is that for all the way through, uh, I, I would have to say through the Civil War and into the early Jim Crow times, I'm sure much later, but I'll leave it at that. So that's a definitive time I can say this. We weren't right. treated as human beings. We were considered three-fifths of a person. Mm -hmm. Think about that. We were yes. considered three-fifths of a human being. So from that premise, so many brutalities of dehumanizing things can be validated if you don't think we're human beings to begin with. Right. That is why George's neck got to be snapped under that man's knee because the man didn't see him as a human being. And we have right. to go back to that. But one other factoid. Every single violent protest in this United States since my birth has been because, except for the riots that occurred when Martin Luther King was killed, has been a result of a police brutalizing act. Police brutality is the reason why we riot. We're not rioting because of, of, of we're, we're rioting for our very lives. Mm -hmm. And frankly, the social contract between black Americans and white Americans was broken a long time ago. And I think that until white Americans understand that this social contract was broken and not by us, but by the acts that they have done, we can certainly right. find them in history. I can name two, Rosewood and Tulsa, Oklahoma, the Black Wall Street, 1918. Black folks were doing what they needed to do for themselves, which is supporting and taking care of themselves and making mm -hmm. valued businesses. And they right. were murdered and killed and the entire section of town raised. So until white America and white people understand that the social contract between us is broken, and frankly, I think it's amazing that all we're really asking for is, is equality, to be honest. Right. Um, so <laughs> that's where it has to start. Stop right. thinking of us as less than. Stop dehumanizing our experiences. Stop only believing our experiences matter when they're recorded by an iPhone. You this know, and even going on forever, and it has and, to stop. And even you know, that, you know, I will say that. I actually had a debate with somebody because even with the video recording, they were hung up on this piece um, of allegedly. There was a video of the young man who was walking in Central Park and he asked a woman to please put her dog on a leash in a leash required area. And the woman Jack, got uh, here. It's Cooper the bird watcher, right? Yes, the bird watcher. Okay. Yes, him. Um, but for those who don't know the full story, um, this young man was walking in Central Park, came across a young woman with her dog. 
her dog was off leash in a part of the park where dogs are supposed to be on leashes. Um, he did ask her to please put a leash on her dog and she gets very upset. Um, he's recording and she basically in the video says, you know, I'm going to call 911 and tell them that I'm being attacked by a black man. She just, weaponized, she just weaponized his right. very existence. And, and that's crazy is that you know exactly what words to say mm -hmm. that you know are going to cause, cause a reaction. Mm -hmm. And I, I love that you brought up that unless there wasn't a white person there, then my life wasn't valid. It honestly, which actually goes back to why having these conversations are so important because that's such an empathetic moment that maybe perhaps people don't understand because they're they're male or they're white or what have you. But I guarantee that every female knows what it feels like to have a man never leave you alone until you say, I have a boyfriend. So because right. all of a sudden you have a male figure in your life, then then I can let go. Like you're you're not of value. You're still free reign and I can do whatever I want to you unless you have a boyfriend, then that's hands off. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, or in you know what you were explaining about my story, to know that not only is my life not of value because I'm black, but I'm not of value because I'm a female. And it took a white male, white six foot, 200 pound male stepping in to say, no, I know her, or to even act as that cover, um, or just to even act as that ally. And it's, it's infuriating, but at the same time, it's something that a lot of women have gone through, but when, which actually I, I bet would humanize or put, put our experiences in a way that people can understand because no one likes that feeling. No one likes the feeling of feeling like they don't matter or that their voice has been taken away. And just to know that that happens, you know, taking that and putting that in words or putting that in a feeling that maybe somebody can understand, you know, that's that's the first step of, of educating and starting that uncomfortable conversation is you don't, and maybe not everyone knows what that discomfort feels like. Maybe right. not one knows what it feels like to feel as though you don't matter or that your worth has been stripped away. But there are times in your life where you've probably felt less than. Um, and it's not it's not a fun feeling. It's not a fun feeling to operate that way or to even walk into rooms and wonder, oh, I wonder what's the first thing that they're going to see that I'm black or that I'm a woman, which happened at a job interview for me. The manager who was interviewing me didn't know I was in the lobby. And he asked um, one of the, the people who selected me to come in. So I guess the HR person, I suppose, he asked her um, to tell him about her, about me. And she was like, oh, you know, she's in my class. She's, she's smart. She worked in project management, so on and so forth. She's black. And out of everything he said, out of everything that she said about me, all the wonderful things, his first question was, wait, how black are we talking? Um, Obama black or <laughs> black? And I'm thinking, what? Oh my God. what is it? What? <laughs> um, wow. it was, it but it, it changed the moment. It changed, sure. it changed it uh, because I actually wasn't nervous for that interview anymore. Oh, but you weren't. But you weren't. Like, no matter what, so, it's going to be fine. I, I know we have to wrap this up soon. And I think, because um, right where we are right now is a pretty tough place to be. Like saying, yeah. if, if we summarize, you know, hey, white people who 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 don't believe in racism, hey, be uncomfortable with what's going on. And I get that. That's really not, not a very uplifting message to to give to anyone. Absolutely. But I think what, what I want to let the, what I would like to leave as some of the last conversation we have is that again, it goes back to the gratitude and being able to change perceptions, be given an opportunity to talk to people about how we really feel, because honestly, it is going to be one conversation at a time. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many white people who care about me have called me over these last two weeks to say to me, I'm thinking about you. I'm thinking about your family. I'm wondering if you're okay. And I can't tell you how gratified I am by those simple outreaches of I see you, I hear you, and I ache for you. It starts there. 
I mean, because right. I can best believe that the people who shared that with me weren't thinking of me as any less of a fifth of a human being than anyone else. Right. These are people that love Victoria, that love Jeremy, and love what's going on in their lives. And so I just would make that ask, have a conversation. If you don't know someone of color and you want to have a conversation with me about what I'm going through, call me. I'm happy to have a conversation right. with you. But find someone you trust, someone that you can approach, someone that you don't think is going to tell you what you think or feel is ridiculous and right. have, have that honest conversation with them and be right. sincere. And I honestly believe if the sincerity is what's first received, that we can do this. We can really make this change. We can make right. it for this, for my son, for the children you don't have, but one day will. We can mm -hmm. make this change. And right. this is not a big ask. It's not. It's a journey. What they say, the journey of a thousand miles starts with the first single step. Take right. the step. Take the step. Don't be afraid to take the step. Don't be afraid to reach out. Because I can tell you, 14 years ago, the other day, um, I was feeling sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I am not the original originator of that statement. That's from Fannie Lou Hamer, 1964, civil rights activist who died helping people get the right to vote. She was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Right. And that's what it takes. Let's and all just be sick and tired of being sick and tired. And that's the place where you you see change. I'm sick and tired of feeling yeah. like I have no energy, so I might eat healthier. I'm sick and tired of, you know, not being able to spend time with my family, so I might look for, you know, something else to do with my time so I can be home with my family every day. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. It, it seems like we've had this conversation a hundred times. Well, that's because everyone gets by the time we're actually getting to the parts of the conversation we need to talk about, everybody is so angry and up in arms and close. And you can't have, you can't always have a conversation, a constructive conversation with two people yelling. My grandmother used to say, <laughs> if, don't, don't ever argue with the fool. Cause when people walk by, they won't know who the real fool is. Right. I wonder if, if they're, and I think your call to action is well put. And it's a very, very attainable ask you know, approach the conversation with sincerity. And I guarantee most most Black people and African-Americans or even people of color in general that I know are happy, we are so happy to explain why. We, we do operate from a place of education and growth. We And it's painful for us. If And that's the funny thing. Like, if you think about how sick everybody is of hearing about the conversation. How sick are we looking at Twitter or looking at the news or seeing this happen again? Mm -hmm. How tired are we of seeing this every day? Right yep. And we're ready to have the conversation. We're ready to move forward. But yes, part of that is being uncomfortable. Part of that is identifying there is a gap right here and we we don't want this to keep happening. Well, I think we should just end it there. Well done. I think we should, well yeah. Yes. Well, thank you so much again oh, for always, you. always, always bringing food for thought and always fellowshipping with me. I appreciate Anytime. it. Anytime.